Well, we're glad, you, glad you're here. Or as you know, South Carolina is booming, and one reason that we are booming is that uh, when the pandemic came along, we used uh, common sense, a lot of advice, and in, instead of uh, slowing down or stopping, we just tapped the brakes a little and then stepped on the gas. And a lot of, a lot of that activity involved the South Carolina Department of Employment and uh, Workforce and its director, Danny Elsey who is uh, here today with some news. Thank you, Mr. Governor. <clears throat> Friends, colleagues, members of the media, uh, on April 30th, 2019, I began my employment with the South Carolina Department of Employment and Workforce. Exactly three years, seven months, eight days, and one pandemic later, I'm announcing I'll be retiring from employment on February 28th of next year. I've enjoyed it. I can guarantee you I learned a lot during that uh, uh, time period. And I would like to reflect just for a minute about some of the things that we uh, did. Now, some of you may be wondering why we're announcing uh, retirement today if it's not to the end of February under statute for this position. You have to go through the due uh, evaluation committee and then Nomination uh, names go to the governor for nomination then back to the Senate for approval takes a while. So we're doing this in advance First of all a lot of people ask why did I ever take the job? Um, and there are a lot of answers for that uh, some of you know that my uh, First career was that of a management labor lawyer management labor lawyer representing mostly large manufacturers mostly on a national basis and in the area I worked in, the workforce is the key to a lot of the answers to labor issues. You get good employees, you get good employer relations, and workforce development plays a key role in that. So, so I had an interest in workforce development. I knew the impact of it on South Carolina because I participated on a pro bono, for free basis with the Department of Commerce for many years advising them on, lab on uh, labor issues involving the recruitment of different uh, companies. And from my own clients, I know what they're looking for when they go out looking for a site. And it's not just land and it's not just a railroad spur. It's people. Who's going to do the work? Are they hardworking? Are they loyal? And are they trainable? Workforce development plays a major role uh, in that. <clears throat> I've always been interested as well in labor force participation. I understand what it means to a state, what it means to our economy, what it means to the well-being of our citizens. And I know that in South Carolina, we can improve this. And I know that workforce development is a key to our improving our labor force participation rate. So for these reasons, I made the decision to take the job. And I felt like it was one that I could possibly make a difference in the state of South Carolina. So when I first moved into the job, I did exactly what I thought we were going to do. We did some creative programs. We helped employers find employees. Now remember, this was uh, <clears throat> back in April of 2019, and the unemployment rate is low, 2.3%, very low, one of the lowest in the nation. Employers were having trouble finding employees. High-paying manufacturers in the upstate, $25 an hour, can't get employees. So we looked around and came back and said, well, why don't we go into North Carolina and do job fairs for South Carolina manufacturers? And the only companies we'll allow to participate are high paying manufacturers above $20 an hour. So we go into North Carolina into areas not nearly as developed as our upstate, run our job fair and probably have the best job fair we've ever had in the history of South Carolina, even though it was held in North Carolina to bring employees into the state of South Carolina. One of my big interests in this job also was the rural area and the problems that we've got from an economic standpoint in rural areas and the challenges that they, they face. We went into Fairfax, South Carolina and did a pilot with a company that I was very familiar with, Scotsman Commercial Ice Machines, where we looked at selective training for selective people outside of the federal training that we do. So we were had a lot of flexibility in terms of how we, uh, uh, how we did it. Highly successful, the company raved about it. We went back up to Spartanburg and helped a company get past a uh, workforce issue by convincing them to try creative shifts. They couldn't, fund, they couldn't staff their second shift that runs from three to 11. So we studied it and came back and said, let's split it in half. 
for people who want to work four hours. Let's kind of let them come in and work three to seven or seven to 11. Well, you can imagine what corporate America would think of that. Not much, but they finally agreed to it, got their corporate leaders to agree to it, did it, and it's the most remarkable success you've ever seen in your life. So three programs, three very promising programs from a workforce standpoint, and we were ready to go with them on a statewide basis as fast as we could go. And then we all know what happened. The pandemic hit and our lives changed. I know yours did and mine did as well. We did nothing after that but focus on unemployment, paying it. Not just South Carolina unemployment insurance, which we knew how to pay, in which we had our computers and portals set up to run, but new programs, federal programs, programs like FPUC, P-E-U-C, P-U-A, L-W-A, M-E-U-C, nobody had ever heard of those before this. And they weren't automatic folks. They didn't come down from the Department of Labor with something that you plug into your computers and run them. Every one of these programs required coding, coding of our existing programs to be able to run the new ones as we go through the uh, unemployment process. To do that, we had to wait on DOL for instructions, Department of Labor, federal government responsible for all this. And then we had to wait some more, and we had to wait some more. Now, during this time, we're waiting on instructions to even start coding the computers. People are screaming for unemployment. You know, where's that 600 a week that they're gonna get from the federal government? We finally get the instructions, we do the coding, and six months later they come back and say, whoops, we made a mistake, We're not, you're not doing it right, we, we told you wrong, so let's redo it. Do it a different way. If you ever need a definition of the word frustration, just start with D in the uh, dictionary. Pandemic claims, 2,000 a week, we went up to 88,000 a week in nothing flat. Now, all of you are reporters of some, site, some type, let me give you an example. Let's assume you've got to write five articles a week. Got to get them into the editor, got to get them done. You name your number, I don't know what it is, but let's assume it's five a week. And then your editor walks in one day and says, instead of doing five this week and from now on, I want you to do 200 a week. Well, that's what happened to us with the claims folks as they go from 2,000 a week up to 88,000 per, uh, per week. But we ran them, 905,000 initial claims, 300,000 claims in April alone, $6.4 billion paid out during the pandemic, $6.4 billion. Now to put that in context, go look at the general revenue fund for the state of South Carolina in 2019 and you'll see it wasn't all that much greater than this number. We were one of the fastest states in getting our programs in going. We got most of our in going right without major problems. We didn't have our computers crash like Florida. We're not still adjudicating pandemic claims like some states are. We got ours done. <clears throat> Today, South Carolina's prospering. We've got 2,308,000 people working. That folks is 65,000 more than we had pre-pandemic. Today, we've got 107,000 posted jobs that are open in the state of South Carolina. That's 40,000 more than we had pre-pandemic. You add those two together, and we have an employer demand for employees of over 105,000 increase over pre-pandemic days. It's a remarkable, strong economy where employers definitely need um, employees. Why'd that happen? Why were we quicker than most states? I think there's two reasons. I think the governor referenced the first one. He didn't shut the economy down. He looked selectively at certain industries, shut them down for a while, and brought them back up. I was interviewed during the pandemic on a, for a TV show, and they said, well, Dan, what do you think about the governor's timing and shutting down and opening back up? And that, of course, that was a bad question to be asking me to begin with. But I said, you don't have to look at my opinion, just look at the facts. He nailed it went down at exactly the right time and the right amount and came back at exactly the right time and the numbers proved that that was exactly right. And that was what the uh, reporter took and reported. <clears throat> Any event, Governor McMaster did his job and then we sort of backed into it ourselves. Uh, we were smack in the middle of paying unemployment benefits in the middle of 2020 when we decided to start reemployment efforts, 
start talking to people about going back to work. Now think about this, in June of 2020, the pandemic was full speed in April. So two months later, we're talking to people about reemployment. Now why'd we do that? It wasn't like we had any great vision. I thought the benefits were really gonna end when the CARES Act ended, which would have been a few months later. Well, as we later learned, they didn't. They went on for well over a year and a half through September of 2021. But as a result of that, false reading of things by me, we started reemployment. We got a big head start. We started educating people on research that shows at the end of a recession, the best jobs go first. A lot of jobs out there, folks, go back out there right now and claim the good ones and get yourself a medical. You ain't got any medical with unemployment. So we had people moving back toward reemployment in South Carolina well before most other uh, states did. Post pandemic, we got back to uh, working on reemployment once again. <clears throat> we initiated, I can't tell you how many programs. Uh, Dorothy has got a uh, list that we'll hand out to any of you who are interested in it of the programs that we initiated during and after the pandemic. Reemployment workforce development programs. I think you'd be interested in reading about a number of them. I'll just touch on the very highlights. And one of them I want to mention is what we call RAP, Workforce Reemployment Assistance Program. That is a UI, unemployment program. Historically, in South Carolina, if you file for unemployment and you're found eligible, you draw for 20 weeks and nobody asks you any questions. As long as you certify every week, I'm still out of work, and you do your two work searches on a computer. You do that, nobody bothers you. 20 weeks later, you don't have a job, you're out of unemployment. We completely revamped that, scrapped it. Now, in the first week you file a claim, even before you're found eligible, you're going to get a phone call. And we're going to talk to you about unemployment and what it means and what you're going to have to do to keep the unemployment if you get it in terms of certifying and, and doing your work searches. We also start talking to them about resumes and job skills and interviewing and that sort of thing, talking about getting them back to work. When they're found eligible, they get another call saying the same thing. And a meeting is set up for a face-to-face sit-down with the people. And they come in and we talk with them about, show us what you're doing, who have you applied with, what are you doing, let me see your resume, let's work on it, let's redo it. How's your interview skills? Can you explain this gap in your employment? What are you telling employers about it? How about this prison sentence you had? What are you telling employers about it? Let's help you with a letter so you can explain these things to your employer during a uh, interview. And then we tell them <coughs> that we're gonna be making it what we call enhanced referrals starting the following week, which means you go, you must go and apply for this job. So this program is, is a very good program. It's a takeoff and an enhancement of a federal program called RESEA, RESEA. Uh, <coughs> we do it for every single employee who is not part of RESEA. So everyone has hands-on attention by somebody talking to them about getting a job. Now we track what Department of Labor calls duration, how long people are on unemployment. Is it 20 weeks or is it one week? Look at it as an average. What's the impact of this program? I can't tell you. I can tell you this, our duration is going down. That's probably due to some extent to this program. It's also due to the economy and other things that it is going down. But it's a good program. We're sold on it and we're going to uh, stick with it. <clears throat> so what am I going to do between today and February 28th? Well, I still got some major targets out there, some programs we want to finish, some things we would like to conclude, uh, some programs that are near and dear to my heart, like the labor force tax rate. Uh, when I first sat down with the governor and explained to him what we wanted to do on this labor force participation rate task force, and laid out what it is, he looked at me and said, Dan, I can't believe that's never been done before. But it had Nobody's ever taken a look at it. As far as we can tell, no other state has except on a very high-level policy look. They've never really looked at the exact reasons. Well, what we did here was put together a group of the top labor economists in the state of South Carolina, one from Carolina, Clemson, College of Charleston, all Ph.D. labor economists, then we went to the for-profit research companies, companies like Chimura and many others, and asked for their labor economists and people like Indeed and asked for their labor economists to, to serve. We didn't pay a single one of these people a penny to do it. Every one of them volunteered their time and not one single person turned us down. 
Now, I think there's a reason for that, and I don't think it's completely benevolence on their part. This was an opportunity to really do something in one state that once you do it and once you get it right, you can take it to other states and replicate it, and those for-profit people are in the business of doing just that. So we did it, and it's well on its way. We've already gotten part number one back. That's the survey, where we hired a survey company to survey. survey. Everyone who worked in South Carolina in 2019 got laid off in pandemic and did not go back to work. That was 160-some thousand people. They contacted interviewed 6,000. That makes it very statistically significant. We got the results in, we've got their conclusions, and we got the raw data that we can take, take down to a uh, zip code level for further analysis. Secondly, we just got in the research, the final research that lays out why the people think our labor force participation rate is so much lower than the rest of the nation, what caused it. Up until 1994, we were dead even with the national average. And then it diverged. They went like that, and we went like that, so that there is a discrepancy now. So we are analyzing that now. We have a task force meeting coming up tomorrow where we will be reviewing the research with them. The third prong of this thing is an on-the-ground, hands-on, bottom-up program. We call it Lawrence County Direct Connect. We picked Lawrence County as the pilot program. It's a small county, small enough for us to get our hands around. Uh, it's located in a good place, borders Greenville, a lot of jobs, Greenwood, a lot of jobs, and there are a fair number of jobs in Lawrence as it is. We did the same thing there that our survey people did. We contacted, we looked at everybody in Lawrence County that had a job in 19, filed an unemployment claim during the pandemic, and was not working now, 1,260 people. But instead of just surveying them, we got people on the ground, teams of them there, setting up meetings with them, talking to them, and there's two purposes in the talk. Number one, can't we get you a job? We got jobs lined up, folks. You want to work in manufacturing? Look what they're banking right now, $22 an hour. So we are trying to convince them to take the jobs that are near them, and if they say no, absolutely not, they're not interested, we're doing a survey with them to try to learn from it. When we finish these three prongs, the research, the survey, and the Lawrence Direct Connect, we will, our task force will, put it all together and come up with recommendations, and then we'll go into phase two of the task force, which will be implementation, execution. What do we do about it? It's gonna require statutory changes, I'm sure, which means we'll have the legislature and the governor's office involved. Um, but uh, I think it's got great, great potential. And here's the payback. If we could raise our labor force participation rate by one percentage point, that would increase wages in the state of South Carolina by over $1.1 billion per year. And think of the impact on communities that those dollars are spent in cafe restaurants and cafeterias and bookstores and uh, places like that. So great potential there. Cyber workforce, it's gonna be one of our major challenges. It's gonna be huge for the America. And because of the number of defense contractors we have in South Carolina, it's gonna be big here. We're on the, the cyber workforce team. Uh, we're on the cyber team doing the workforce part of it, I should say, uh, and that is a major focus for us. We are on the uh, electric vehicle team based on the governor's executive order. We're very, very involved in that, looking at jobs, looking at occupations, requirements for training, and uh, that sort of thing. We're gonna continue looking at creative shift schedules. I don't know whether y'all are following it, but population changes means there's going to be a shortage of employees in the future in every state. And we're going to have to figure out how to deal with it. Uh, and there are many ways to deal with it. You can deal with it with legal immigration. You can deal with it with automation. China last year bought almost 50% of all the industrial robotics made in, in the world. China. I mean, they've seen it. They know where they're going, and they know what they got to do to automate their way through it. We're going to have to do that as well. We've already got people who are manufacturers who are using robots like crazy. What we've got to do is make sure they got the workforce, people who can be trained to code those robots and to fix those robots that they're using in the different uh, manufacturing plants. Rural program, we're going to continue focusing on that. Marlboro County is a top priority of mine. Marlboro County has been hit by a tsunami when when uh, Mohawk closed their mill up there, 600 and some jobs gone, 600 of the highest paying jobs in the county. 
600 of their manufacturing jobs. I mean, it is gonna have a phenomenal impact on that county. We've done an awful lot. We've met with all the employees. We've done resumes for them. We've helped them through job fairs. We've helped most of them get a job. We only have 135 of them now filing unemployment benefits. So while we don't have the names of the others, we're assuming they've got, uh, that got jobs, but that's gonna have an impact on that community for a long time. And we're committed to working with Department of Commerce to produce, create a cadre of people up there, in addition to the old Mohawk people who have been through the technical college uh, mechanics maintenance course. It's not a maintenance course, it's a mechanics course, introduction to basically uh, manufacturing equipment uh, so that we can show a prospect when they come to look at that plant that not only do you have all the old Mohawk people, but you've got these 200 people who are working in restaurants and retail and other places who are eager to come to work for you if you buy this plant and open it up. Probably my main focus that I will spend the majority of my time on, though, is a program that really involves the coordination of workforce development in South Carolina. Right now, workforce development is split up among numerous agencies within the state. Many of them play a small role in it. We play a large role in it. That is our only uh, mission. We've got to pull it together. We've got to get everyone coordinated working in the same direction if we're gonna be successful. We gotta have a plan. Right now, there is no plan that says South Carolina in 10 years is gonna need X of these people, Y of these people, and Z of these different occupations. It's gotta be done. We gotta sit down and look at what we're gonna need, and then how many are being trained, how many completers are there each year and then do the math and to see what the gap is. That's called a supply gap analysis. We've done it for EV, we've done it for energy, we've done it for cyber. We as a state need to do it for the entire state and get agreement on it so that the people conducting the training like the state tactical colleges and the, and the higher education can focus their courses in the uh, right directions. We gotta get data analytics under control, of state agencies, ours. We share ours, we send all of our data, most of it to RFA that goes in there about a database and other agencies can use it, de-identified, they can't use the name, but they can get de-identified data on ours. Other agencies are not doing it, and other agencies are gonna have to do it at some point. All agencies that have got this important information, whether it's education, higher education, or whatever, technical colleges, have gotta get their information in there, otherwise we can never really measure the return on our investment. So we pay governor's money pays to train people in the technical college. Well, we don't know whether they go to work right now in South Carolina or North Carolina. Uh, and even if we do know that, we don't know for sure how much they're making. So it's hard to tell without this data exactly what we need to do and not need to do. Anyway, that's gonna be one of my major focuses between now and uh, uh, February 28th. Now, I've talked a lot about myself and a lot about the agency, but let me say something else about the agency. I didn't know anybody at the Department of Employment Workforce when I went there. Uh, I met a couple of them during the process. Uh, but folks, that is 600, that's a group of 630 people that are hard working, loyal, and went through the most miserable 18 months of anybody's life that you could imagine and stuck with us. Hard working people, how would you like to be on those call phone, on those, in that call center answering those calls from people who were trying to get um, unemployment? It was. Very difficult. In any event, we got a great group of people. Uh, the management team there is the strongest as it could possibly be, much, much stronger than it was back in 2019. And I am completely confident, God help us if we have another pandemic, you'll be on your own for that one. <laughs> but, uh, but we will be in much better shape to take it if, we, uh, uh, if it does ever happen. All right. <clears throat> anyway, I'm moving on. But it won't be until February 28th. I will stick around to make sure the transition that you got somebody in place and everything is smooth before I, uh, uh, before I leave. Uh, I said at the beginning I took this job because I thought maybe I could make a difference. And, you know, we're close to four years into it. And I can look back and say, did we make a difference? I, I'm not absolutely positive. Time will tell. Next three or four years we'll see whether or not uh, I really did or not. Uh, Governor, neither one of us could have anticipated what was coming. Um, I learned a lot. I enjoyed it. You're a great governor and a great citizen of South Carolina. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. 
<clears throat> well, y'all, if, if you've, uh, I don't know if they have visionary, sophisticated workforce development courses in college, but if, if they don't, you, you ought to get credit for listening to this one. Uh, uh, what, uh, what Danny Elsey has described, the things they did, particularly uh, under the, the stress and encouragement of the pandemic, it really put South Carolina in a, in a class by itself. Uh, the things that he's, he's mentioned, some other states have some of these programs. They've discovered some of these processes and some of these avenues uh, for the future, but uh, none, none of them that, that any of us know of have, have it all in, in one package and all ready to go and already in operation like we do in South Carolina. And uh, the, the work that the workforce development did during the pandemic with uh, answering the phone, handling the money, uh, giving people assurance that help was on the way, telling them where to go, where to get things. It was all part of a very big plan to help and protect our people. And it, it would not have been possible without the extraordinary work and commitment of the everyone in the Department of Employment and Workforce, aided, of course, by the other departments, most notably the Department of Administration, uh, but this is, uh, it's been a great four years. There's no doubt about it. I think it's extraordinary progress and accomplishment and it just shows that what can be done and what was done was largely responsible, one of the critical factors in the success that, we've, that we're enjoying right now. I want to remind you, our capital investment this year, this year alone, uh, Mr. Elsey, is, Director Elsey, is uh, over $6 billion so far and we've still got the rest of this month to go. That's not happening in, in most other places. So I want to, uh, I know you, you're not gone yet. Uh, if you change your mind, be sure to let me know. I know Jane and the children are, are ready uh, for you. Um, Danny Ells and I have known each other since, since college and he married his college sweetheart and we've been friends all these years. So when, when I heard that he was available, of course, I scooped him right up and I'm thankful that he agreed to take on a very big job and not only did he do it but did it extraordinarily well with a, a very great staff. So we want to thank you uh, and we'll be glad to take your questions. We have a, a great cabinet. Um, we may have some but uh, coming, but n nothing to announce at this point. But we have, we have a great cabinet, and I'm, uh, a, a number of have told me over, over the, the years that this is the best work they've ever had, and they want to stay as long as they can. We did, we did not start the search requirements again. We didn't start that until we ended the benefits. What we did was encourage people who were well and able to work to go ahead and do it. You know, you've been working in somewhere and you're making $12 an hour. And folks, there are $20 an hour jobs out there. Go for it right now because they're hiring. And those were the people we were moving. We wanted to make sure everybody understood that the research shows best jobs go first. If you don't get one, you're going to be looking at the bottom of the list if you wait for the benefits to end. So we weren't pushing sick people at all. This was people who were able to work, ready to work, and, um, and many of them listened to us and did just that. And that's what got us headed back to, to employment much quicker than other states. With unemployment as low as it is, do you think that the unemployment rate can go down? And if so, what is the key to that? How much lower can it go? Well, you know, it... it uh, it went down steadily uh, as the pandemic ended and was headed back down to a very low. You know, we're now seeing warn notices, plant closures. We're seeing layoffs, most of them temporary. Many of them automotive related, which means supply issues. Uh, so we're, we're seeing a little bump and you, you, you read the papers like I do, you know, many people are predicting a recession. If we had, if we hit a recession, then unemployment rate will go back up some. But we historically have a uh, very, very low unemployment rate in South Carolina, much lower than the national average, and we're still there today. 
More questions? Okay. Um, how quickly are you going to flush all that out that Super just uh, recited? Say that again? How quickly are you going to forget about all the alphabet that Super just recited? Oh, <laughs> those are out of my memory. <laughs> Y'all, thank you very much. Appreciate it.